And good morning, everyone. It's great to have the opportunity to be with you today. Uh, like Reinhardt was saying, we're really excited about next Sunday because next Sunday, Albany becomes a fully fledged restore congregation. And so we're live streaming from Albany so that we can all join in that experience and celebrate a new season for Albany and also a new season in the life of Restore. And it's great that on a day of celebration, we can also begin 21 days of prayer and fasting. I can hear you shouting and uh, cheering and uh, clapping me on as we do that. I can hear it. I can hear it. Um, it's been a great series, hasn't it, this uh, last series, He Restores My Soul. Uh, this is uh, what we've been looking at over the last six weeks. And if ever there was, was a year where we needed some soul restoration, it's been this year, hasn't it? I think for many of us, uh, we've experienced incredible squeezing. And uh, the reality is, and uh, just an honesty moment, a truth moment, we don't know what the autumn has yet to hold for us either. And so it's really, really important. One of the things we've been looking at over this uh, summer season is some of the practices that we need to not just do in the summer when we've had a hard year to help restore our souls, although it is really important to have the opportunity to do that and to lean into that. But actually, we hope that these are practices that we will put into our everyday life, our regular life calendar, because they're keys to having a restored soul. And I love the fact that when Jodie spoke on the first week, she just kind of redefined that verse about he restores my soul to he brings my soul back. He brings my soul back. And my prayer, our prayer together over this season as restore is that we will experience the resurrection power of Jesus, bringing our souls back to life. And uh, today, we're looking at the exciting topic of fasting. I'm excited about fasting. Um, I don't know how you're feeling this morning. You need to put down the biscuits and the coffee because we're talking about fasting. Or maybe you need to make, uh, have lots of biscuits and coffee this week because next week, who knows what's on offer. Um, but I'm really excited about fasting for a couple of reasons. One is I have found personally, like Raynard said at the beginning, I have found fasting to be one of the most significant and powerful spiritual disciplines that I've ever practiced in my life. And I think it's a neglected practice, but I think our uh, spirits and our souls are weaker because it's a neglected practice. And I think in the West, the Western culture is all about materialism, and that's all about me, 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 feed, 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 feed. When we fast, we take a spiritual stance against that. And rather than feed on the culture of the day, we choose to immerse our spirit, to come back to our first love and to proclaim that Jesus is the Lord of my life. And that is a powerful spiritual statement, not just to the world around, but it does something inside of us. And so I think where fasting fits into this whole series in terms of he restores my soul is because fasting is an opportunity to ask this question. And the question is, how healthy is my current lifestyle. How healthy is my current lifestyle? Now, I don't read a whole load of uh, stuff on diets and stuff, so I'm not ex an expert on any of that stuff. I just run, and I'm a little bit careful as I have got a little bit older with what I eat, um, but I don't particularly uh, immerse myself in the whole diet season. Uh, but I do know that one of the things that has become more popular in terms of the diet scene is detox diets. And we've discovered that it's healthy to take periods of time where we watch what we eat and we allow our bodies to detox and we reduce some of the chemicals and the E numbers and all of that kind of stuff. And it does something to detox our bodies. Well, where fasting fits in and soul restoration comes into play with the practice of fasting is I believe fasting is an opportunity to detox our souls and our spirits which is why it's helpful at the very beginning to ask the question, how healthy is my current lifestyle? And I just want to encourage you, don't let that be a question that you just hear this morning. Let it be something that you take away and you ponder on. And you ask the question, what would it be helpful for me to change to make my lifestyle more healthy so that my soul health, my spirit health, might grow and increase. Jesus talks about um, healthy eating in, uh, in Matthew chapter 15. And he says this, he says, it's not what enters into the mouth that defiles the man, 
but it's what proceeds out of the mouth. This defiles the man. They were having a debate about unclean, clean and unclean foods. And uh, Jesus says, actually, it isn't about what you eat that makes the difference, but it's what comes out of you. And in Luke chapter 6, he expands on that a bit more. And he says, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And fasting is about sorting out what we carry in our hearts and re-evaluating what we feed into our hearts and into our spirits and slimming that down, stripping it back so we can reclaim or bring back our heart health. And as we bring back our heart health, so we rediscover and bring back our soul health. And uh, a long time ago, when I first got into fasting, I did a study on fasting in the whole of the Bible. I looked up actually every instance of a recorded fast uh, right the way through the Bible. And then I uh, grouped them into categories. And from my study, I found out that there's four main reasons why people fast in the Bible. And so for today's sermon, I'm going to look at each of those four, because I think for us it's an opportunity to rediscover the power of fasting once more. And so the primary reason that uh, people fasted in the Bible was this. It was to purify their lives or to purify our lives. And the quotation that I've got there, the verse reference is from Matthew chapter 26. Now that's the story of Jesus in uh, the Garden of Gethsemane with the disciples. And if you remember that story, this was the night before Jesus was going to be crucified. And so he was there pouring out his soul to God in the garden and uh, saying, Father, um, if it's your will, please, will you spare me of what's coming tomorrow? And he takes with him his friends. And the reason he takes with him his friends is he doesn't want to be alone at one of those uh, most pressing moments. Do you know, one of the greatest gifts that God has given us is our friends and faithful friends alongside us. So value and appreciate that. I think we've discovered that over the last year, haven't we? But uh, Jesus' friends, they actually fall asleep. And in verse 41, he says to them, he says, watch and pray that you do not fall into temptation. Why? Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And what Jesus says is, you are being tempted at the moment because there's a battle going on in your life between the flesh what the cravings of your physical body wants, and the spirit, how God would want you to live. And Paul picks up on this in Romans chapter 7, because he says, the good that I want to do, I don't do. But why doesn't he do the good that he wants to do? Because there's a battle going on in his life between the spirit and what the spirit of God wants to do in him, and the cravings of his flesh. And you see, if we're going to become the fully the people that Jesus wants us to be, what we need to do, this is the good news, folk, is we need to crucify our flesh because that takes authority over the flesh. Why? So the power of the Spirit can prevail in our lives. And Jesus said, didn't he? He said discipleship. He said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, what do they need to do? They need to crucify themselves and follow me. And I think quite often in, uh, in the West and in Western culture, which is maybe why we've lost the power of fasting, is we've kind of said, follow after Jesus and he'll love you and he'll make everything okay. Jesus never, ever said that. He said, if you want to be a true disciple, if you want to be a true learner, if you want to be a true apprentice of me, following after me means you need to crucify your flesh. You need to lay aside the old thing. You need to lay aside the old dependencies. And you need to discover the new life that I have for you. And in the book of Ephesians, Paul talks about exactly the same thing. Where in Ephesians 4, he says, you need to put off your old self, be renewed in your thinking, and then put on the new self. And putting off the old self means putting to death or crucifying the other things that have been gods or that I've worshipped or I've empowered in my life so I could be renewed by the spirit of Jesus and then put on my new identity, which is rooted in him, and the power of the spirit then brings me to life. And I discovered this a long, long time ago because when I was a teenager, I'm an introvert. Um, and when I was a teenager, and teenagers, hey, they never come out of their bedrooms, do they, when they're teenagers anyway, let alone an extreme introvert, which I was. But I spent all of my teenage years worshipping the idol of music. I had the, had the radio on every moment of every day, nearly. 
And actually, still now, if you've got a pop quiz um, for one of those quizzes, then I'm a good person to have on your side because anything from the 60s, 70s, 80s, I'll tell you where it got in the charts, I'll tell you who wrote it, I'll tell you who produced it, I might even tell you who played on the track. I just worshipped and worshipped and worshipped the idol of, of music. And I found my comfort there. I found my place of peace there. I found my place of refuge there. And every week I would spend all my pocket money on, I had the greatest vinyl collection. Actually, it's a bit sad. Abby has got me back into vinyls again. Abby's got back into vinyl records. And they're really expensive these days. And if I had my old vinyl record collection, I'd be a lot wealthier than I currently am. <laughs> but why haven't I got my old vinyl record collection? Because the power of Jesus broke into my life and things got reorientated. And I used to really struggle. I, I became a Christian at university and I would live the Jesus life really well at university. When I got home, back into my old context, I really struggled to live out the new identity and, and the new life that I had. And partly it was because everybody treated me as the old Ian, and so I fell back into living out of the old self. But it's also because I fell back into the old powers of the flesh. And one day I was wrestling with that, and I felt like God said, you need to take something that represents your old life, and you need to put it to death as a statement that your old man has died, and you're living a new way. And so I went to my bedroom and I gathered up the whole of my vinyl record collection. I put it in black bin sacks. I put all the uh, uh, magazines I had and all of that stuff, put it all into black bin sacks, came downstairs, loaded it into the boot of the car, drove to the local dump and I threw it down bit by bit. And I said, this will no longer be an idol in my life. The power of Jesus is stronger. And you know what? It broke something. And I started to be able at home to live out my new identity in a new way. What was I doing? I was making a spiritual statement that I needed to break the power of the flesh in my life. And it was on the back of choices like that, that Jesus has been able to do the work that he has in my life. I'm not saying I'm perfect by any means. And, and I regularly have to continue to put the power of the flesh to death. But it's moments like that where we make choices over who is the Lord of my life. And you see, the reality is when we fall short, when we sin, and the word sin has the letter I in the middle, it's normally because we give in to the power of the flesh. And right the way through the Bible, time and time again, you'll find when Israel fell short and God convicted them of it, what they did was they called a fast. And they said, actually, they recognized they'd fallen short because they'd given place to the power of the flesh. So how do you find breakthrough? You then fast to say, actually, my flesh needs to be submitted to Jesus. Look at what happens to David when he sins with Bathsheba. When he gets convicted by Nathan the prophet, the very next thing he does, he repents and he fasts because he knows it's unsanctified flesh. Flesh given over to the power of sexuality, not surrendered to the power of Jesus that took him out. So when he repents as a part of that, he does something that is a physical act, but he's making a spiritual statement that says the power of my flesh needs to be broken. Now, for many of us over the last year, one of the ways we will have coped is by leaning in to fleshly comforts. Now, that's not necessarily bad. You know, I believe God created chocolate. <laughs> Jesus did miracles where he turned water into wine. There's, uh, uh, all of these things are gifts from God that can be really healthy comforts, healthy things to enjoy. However... If you go to the same place over and over again, what started off as a gift from God becomes an idol or an addiction. And I think something that we should maybe evaluate when we're thinking about how healthy is my current lifestyle 
What are the places of comfort that I've gone to over the last 12 months? And do I need to bring those back to Jesus and just make sure they're in the right place and they come second to him rather than be something else that becomes enthroned in the place of him? And you see, when we take some time to do that and evaluate that in a season of fasting, what we're doing is it's like we're doing gardening in our heart. And where the weeds have grown up, and some of those weeds, if they're let continue to grow, they start to crowd out the good stuff. And 21 days of prayer and fasting is an opportunity to do some gardening on your heart and to root up some weeds that represent the power of the flesh so that the life of Jesus once more can come to bloom. So the first reason that people fasted in the Bible, it was to purify their lives, to say, no longer will my flesh have power over me. And on these 21 days of prayer and fasting, I think for some of us it would really benefit us to either throw some things away or give them up to say, no, actually, Jesus is my comfort before this thing. Jesus is my God before this thing. And we'll make a powerful spiritual statement that says the flesh will not triumph, will not rule in our lives because we want the lordship of Jesus. So number one, it's about purifying our lives. Number two, the reason that people regularly fasted in the Bible was to see the power of God released. To see the power of God released. And uh, the verse I've got there is in Luke chapter 4, verse 14. That comes from the story of Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. And obviously when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, what was going on? There was a battle between his flesh and his spirit. There was a battle over who he was going to serve. Was he going to listen to God's word or was he going to serve the enemy, and listen to his words. And what's interesting in that story is Luke chapter 4, verse 1, after his baptism, it says Jesus went into the desert full of the Holy Spirit. And the Greek word that's used there is a Greek word for a container being full, like my cup of coffee was earlier. I got a cup and I filled it full of coffee. It's exactly that same word. So Jesus went into into the wilderness full of the power of the Spirit. He then goes through 40 days of being tested by the enemy. What does he do to make sure his spirit prevails over the power of the flesh? He fasts. So when we fast, we follow in the footsteps of Jesus. But what's interesting is is in Luke chapter 14, in in verse 14 of Luke chapter 4, when Jesus comes back out of the desert, it says he returns not full of the Holy Spirit, but actually the words changed. It says he returns in the power of the Spirit. And the Greek word that's used there is the Greek word dunamis, which we translate as dynamite. So Jesus had gone from being full of the Spirit to coming out and moving in the power of the Spirit. The very next thing he does is he goes to the synagogue and he quotes from Isaiah 61. And from that moment on, he starts casting out demons, healing the sick, raising the dead, calming storms. And the power of God flows through him. Why is the power of God to flow, able to flow through him? Because he'd gone through a process of breaking the power of the flesh in his life. If you look in the history of Israel at points of national crisis, when they really needed to see God move, They fasted and they prayed. When Esther was going to go and speak to the king to see if he would issue a decree to save the Jewish nation, they called all the Jewish population to fast and pray for three days. I'm struck by the fact our nation needs to see a move of God. We are in crisis. As a church... Maybe we need to to go back to the simple way that Jesus did it and fast and call out to God for his power to move, to cooperate with Jesus, dethroning these these, uh, powers in our life so that we move from just being full of the Holy Spirit, having a nice time in the Holy Spirit on a Sunday morning as we worship, having him tickle my spirit and my soul, to actually yielding before God, having him break the power of every idol so that I come out anointed in the dynamite of God to see breakthrough. 
It's one of the transformations that I've seen happen in my life when I fast it. Every time, I, I'm not, I'm not, don't think I'm a golden hero of fasting, but through my life, a number of times, I've done some extended fasts, nothing like 40 days. I've done seven days, uh, multiple times, without any foods and with just water. By the end of those seven days, I feel a freedom and a flowing in the Spirit of God. And I know that something's changed. If I get up to speak after that, I know there's a weight, there's an authority on my words. Just like it happened to Jesus, because something has been dethroned and it's changed in my life. And so often in the church, we gather together and we pray and we pray and we pray. And we say, God, I want more power. God, I want to see you move. God, I want to see you move. Sometimes I think God's saying, I'm waiting to see whether you're serious. I'm waiting to see whether you're willing to dethrone these things. And when we dethrone the power of the flesh, it makes a way for God to be able to move in power. So number one, with fasting, it helps us into purity. It helps us back into soul focus and soul health. Number two, it's a key to then moving in the power of God. Number three, it helps us to hear God's voice. It helps us to hear God's voice. The verse again on the uh, slide is from Acts chapter 13. It says, while the church in Antioch were worshipping and fasting... God spoke and said, set apart for me Saul and Barnabas for the work that I've called them to. And the church then commissioned them and uh, Paul was sent out on his first missionary journey and the world began to be transformed through the uh, power of Jesus, through the ministry of Paul. But that moment came as they were worshipping and fasting. And the reality of life today is we have so many voices competing for our attention. You know, I, I know I'm getting older, got more grey hairs. When I was growing up, we didn't have 24 hours TV available. In fact, children's TV was, I think, play school in the morning, started about four o'clock in the afternoon, finished at six. And, and uh, TV for grown-ups will be finished before midnight. And we had less competing voices these days, we've got 24-7, not just TV, we can stream, we can do Netflix, we can do everything else. Don't have to even save up to buy a newspaper. It's all there across the internet. And if we're not careful, our, our, our whole life is full of voices speaking to us and speaking to us and speaking to us. But the problem with that is we get overwhelmed with all the other voices and we lose an ability to tune in to the voice of God. In James, James talks about, oh, uh, there's lots of wisdom in the book of James. One of the bits of wisdom in the book of James is he says we need to be quick to hear and slow to speak. We're in a culture that is very quick to speak, but very slow to hear. And we need to reverse that. I think that's why God gave us two ears and one mouth. Maybe in this 21 days of prayer and fasting... You need to tune out from some of the other voices that fill your time. Maybe you need to put your Netflix subscription on hold. Maybe your fast needs to be from that. In the past, we've had people that have fasted regularly from social media for the 21 days. I think that's a really, really good and powerful fast to do. Maybe you want to give up your this, this will shock you. Maybe you want to give up your mobile phone for 21 days. Hallelujah. I'll take that. Do you know, I, I managed over 30 years of my life, nearly 40 years of my life, without a mobile phone, and I lived. And I still enjoyed life. But you know, if we're not careful, they're, the, they're our go-to places. They're the first place we go to, and they're the first voice that we hear. Do you know what God is speaking to you about right now? As we re-engage with uh, gatherings in the autumn, do you know which location you're going to go to? Do you know what God has spoken? Not where your friends are going. Do you know what God has spoken? Have you heard a word from God? Do you know, to lead the life of this church, I can only do it when I've heard from God. And my job is to hear from God and then speak what God said and point us in that direction. And I get lost if I haven't had the time to hear from God. But I can't hear for you in your everyday life. You have to do that. And I believe God can and does speak to each and every one of us. 
But sometimes to do that, we need to tune out the other things. For we've been talking about Sabbath. It's a day of uh, fasting from work. It's a spiritual statement that says, I'm not a slave to my work. I'm a child of God. I'm a son or a daughter of the living God. We talked about silence and solitude. It's part of what I'm talking about here. It's tuning out. In the Old Testament, there's a great story in uh, 2 Chronicles 20 of Israel under attack. And they don't know what on earth they're going to do. And they call a fast. Funnily enough, as they fast, God speaks to the king, King Jehoshaphat. And he says, line up your troops, put the musicians at the front. I've been in many church uh, meetings that I wish that those musicians could have been the first into battle. But anyway, um, that, that was a joke, but not the ones we have here. Um, he said, put the musicians at the front. Let their praises lead you into battle. As the musicians lead Israel on a march, so the enemy turns on itself and Israel triumphs mm. in the most unlikely scenario. But why? Because Jehoshaphat heard what God was saying. He wasn't playing on his mobile phone. He wasn't catching up with the last box set. He wasn't gossiping with his neighbor. He was tuning out the other voices and listening to the voice of God. Number four, this is my favorite reason why people fasted in the Bible. And actually, what's lovely about this morning, and uh, I love the way that God works, um, Reynard referenced this. When Moses went up the mountain to meet with God, the glory of God came down, and Moses didn't eat or drink for 40 days. Now, that's impossible, unless you're in the presence of the God of the impossible. And there was so much life coming from Moses' encounter with the glory of God on a mountaintop, all his fleshly desires just dropped away. So it wasn't in lots of ways, it wasn't a planned fast, it wasn't at all a planned fast, it's just the flesh dropped away with one glimpse of the glory of God. Maybe that's the reason we should say, God, show me the glory because in those moments, when the glory of God comes, the other stuff will drop away. So where am I going to with this? I'm going to this question as we head towards our 21 days of prayer and fasting. The question I want to ask is, what should I fast from? What should I fast from? And actually, for the health of my soul, what should I fast from? And I've got two questions, or, or two um, pieces of advice on that. Number one, anything you think currently is unhealthy in your life. Anything that you think is currently unhealthy in your life. Second thing, or anything that has the power to be an idol in your life. What should I fast from? Anything that is currently unhealthy in my life. Or secondly, anything that has the power to be an idol. I've known lots of people do lots of different fasts through the years. I believe food fasts are really powerful. I think uh, uh, often one of the greatest cravings of our flesh is the desire to eat. So I think one of the most powerful things you can do, the most common fasts in the Bible are food fasts. Sometimes people fast completely, um, but they do drink as well, um, which is really important to uh, recommend and remind you of. Um, sometimes people did partial food fasts. Daniel did a partial food fast, cut out um, meat and uh, wine and uh, choice foods. And uh, maybe that's something that you want to do over the 21 days. I can't, uh, I can't answer the question for you. You need to ask God on it. But for some of us, there will be specific things that we need to lay down because they have become idols in our life. Maybe don't kick around a football for 21 days. I'm not a footballer, so it doesn't mean a lot to me. <laughs> Maybe I need to lay down my music again for 21 days. I had some friends, and uh, one of the disciplines that they heard God challenge them on was no negative speaking about anyone in their household for 21 days. And again, it says in, it says in, in uh, James... It says in James that if a man is able to bridle his tongue, he's able to control the whole of his body. 
And Israel didn't get food to the promised land. Why? Because they negative spoke. All generation. So maybe for some of us, we need to cut out the negative talk for 21 days. Why? Because it's toxic into your soul and into your spirit. That's why you need to cut it out. Maybe for some of us, alcohol has become a comfort more than we thought it should be. Again, I used to live with a guy who was a young worship leader, and uh, he regularly fasted, and he would take month by month and ask God what he should lay down. And there'd be at least one month every year he would lay down his guitar and his worship leading so that that wasn't his God and that wasn't his primary identity. Maybe for some of us, our security is in the wrong thing. And so as a spiritual power, we need to, as a spiritual statement, we need to dethrone that. For him as well, he used to like a, occasionally a drink late at night and that could become a regular thing. And so at least one month a year, he would lay down alcohol and he would think about his life and he would systematically fast from a number of things that represented for him the power of the flesh. And it was one of the ways that he kept his soul in order. And it was one of the reasons that God was able to bless and grow his ministry. Like I said today, we're concluding the series, He Restores My Soul. What would it be really helpful for you to detox, cut out from your life, so that your soul could start to prosper and thrive as we head into this autumn season. From next Sunday, there's an opportunity to do just that and an opportunity for us as a community of God's people to do that together. I believe wisdom would this morning ask God to start speaking to us about what things we need to surrender and lay down, what things we need to cast off so that we can get hold refocus on, recenter our lives more on the power of Jesus and let him be our Lord again. I'm going to pray, I'm going to invite the worship team to come back to uh, help us to respond to what the Holy Spirit has been speaking to us this morning. But let's just take a moment just where we are. Maybe you want to close your eyes. Recenter your heart, recenter your spirit. Lord, I know that this last year has been quite bruising in many ways. And Lord, I also know that in the squeezing of the last year, you will have squeezed up to the surface in many of us. What are the true comforts that we run to? What are the true things that we empower in our lives? And Lord, this morning, I just want to declare that you are my comfort. You are the first place I run to with my pain. And when I'm squeezed, you are the one that I run to. And more than that, you are the Lord of my life. And Father, as I head into this autumn season, I want to head into this autumn season saying, Jesus is my God. Jesus is my Lord. Jesus is the one who comes first. And Father, as we uh, start to head towards these 21 days of prayer and fasting, Father, I pray that you'll speak to me, but I pray that you'll speak to us and we will recognise what things we need to lay down and yield again and put again under, put afresh under the Lordship of Jesus. Thank you that you want to be not just our Saviour, but also our Lord. It's like Thomas said, my Lord and my God, when he saw the resurrected Jesus. Lord, I surrender again all that I am and all that I have to you. And Father, over these 21 days, I pray that you'll help me to yield the power of my flesh so that your spirit can increasingly work in my life and glorify Jesus.